Well, good day, everyone. Uh, Noon Sharp here in London, and welcome to another FS Club seminar. Uh, Today, we actually have Alan Hughes uh, dialing in from Dublin, which I think is going to be absolutely fascinating because we're talking about health, and far too often we get bound into the UK NHS far too much. There are many health systems out there, and this is a global crisis, and it's likely to be solved, uh, at least partially, by global technology and global funding of that technology. And Alan brings a wealth of experience uh, in that field. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Michael Minelli. I am the executive chairman of CN Group. And it is truly uh, my honor to be able to deliver a wonderful series of webinars uh, with my other co-hosts because of our sponsors. Our sponsors are people typically in the financial services, uh, technology, te- te- technology, uh, or in fact, the uh, social impact fields. And they let us range widely and freely across subjects that we find interesting. And I don't see how uh, one couldn't find uh, today anything to do with technology and health interesting, uh, given the current global pandemic, which I won't dwell upon because I think our news has been full of it. The usual agenda applies uh, for most of our webinars in that I will be out of your way as quickly as possible. And we'll get on to Alan. Alan's uh, CV and details are on the website, uh, and I would encourage you to go and read those to save uh, time for all of us. Uh, He'll be speaking for approximately 20 minutes, uh, no rush one way or the other, uh, but plenty of time for questions and answers. By our standards, we have an an intimate group today with uh, 40 registered, uh, so you should get a lot of time uh, to ask what you like, but please don't send them in at 12.44, as many people think. Uh, send them in as quickly as you can. And to do that, uh, no point in emailing me. My my email is off. Uh, please use the GoToWebinar question facility, uh, which should be there on the dashboard. Just type in a question, and I will field it to Alan or possibly amalgamate it with some other questions if you all have uh, similar views on the subject. So uh, that's uh, by way of introduction. Um, Alan himself, uh, you can see in the webcam there, uh, and Alan, I'm going to hand the floor to you on COVID-19 online healthcare solutions and how this is complementing the front line. Super. Um, look, appreciate the kind introduction, Michael, and delighted to be part of this um, successful series of, of webinars. Uh, and also to our our audience uh, for taking the time uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, Michael, if, if we if we go to the the next slide, please, we can I think we can get through the agenda and go straight into what we're going to cover today. Um, so this this sets out some of the technologies and some of the applications that we're seeing uh, prior to, during, and much more as uh, as COVID has progressed in recent months. So specifically, we're considering the use of video consultation, the use of images to diagnose, monitor, and triage, so remotely. Um, Taking the email symbol there to represent secure in-app multimedia messaging and the use of smart questionnaires. So this is uh, making good use of the clinician's valuable time. Um, A web or chatbot for e-triage. So, uh, for example, uh, chatbots have exploded now in terms of mental health care and, and I'll talk to that later on when we get into some of the clinical areas and I was trying to find an image to represent clinical decision support so I just took the academic the mortar board um, to show how online care solutions are helping across a range of, of care pathways um, and many many other areas like e-prescribing and and other other areas of diagnostics and pathology um, what we're not covering today, as they're huge, um, but they're they're definitely close to and related to sectors, are data and analytics, and then personalized medicine. Um, both are, uh, and, and Michael, when we were chatting beforehand, you talked about the gold mine and then the industries around the gold mine. The, these, the d- discussion of big data is, is a huge discussion. Um, but these are sectors that are just going to explode even more in healthcare um, as a result of the tools at the top of the page. Um, so aims for today are to share awareness of the existing and emerging online solutions, 
uh, increased visibility on the role online care is playing in many, many areas of healthcare. And from a funding and finance perspective, to unlock some of the investor considerations. So, so if you're a funder, investor, or partner, or maybe considering a joint venture, who do you work with and why? What, what, who's going to survive and what does it take to survive? Um, so ne next slide, please, um, Michael. Thank you. Um, so I, I considered this this uh, personal touch uh, carefully, uh, but I, I I think it's worth telling the story. So very simply, I had some surgery at the beginning of March, which happened a week before lockdown, and uh, putting through my my surgeon, you know, basically sent me home pretty quickly and handed me over to a physio in terms of the post operative uh, physio and and rehabilitation. So. Um, had you told me in January that after surgery I would have been using uh, online physiotherapy, I'd have said the one area of, of care where I, I don't see online care accelerating is physiotherapy. But um, in the crisis, needs must. And as a result, from I think it was middle of April until middle of May, I had end-to-end -end, uh, online uh, video consultations. And with my far more presentable and handsome son there, I'm Thankfully, recovery has gone well, but it's it's just a personal story I thought I'd share with with your viewers. Um, but end to end, end to end physiotherapy throughout that period. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So, um, why is online care accelerating? Um, let's look at the demand side and the supply side. So, on the demand side, um, the the, like the the obvious drivers of an aging uh, pop, op, aging aging population globally, rising healthcare costs both across public and private, and and an area that I think we do we should spend some time on is workforce shortages and pressures. So depending on which source you look at, um, globally there will be a shortage of over 10 million healthcare professionals in the next 15 years. Um, so. Already, the need for the use of technology to, to innovate and support these care professionals has been growing for many years. Um, additionally, what's been around for many years are the technology improvements, um, the expanding data, um, patients becoming more consumer-oriented and, and, and their, their ability to choose, um, and, and lastly, market focus. So it's these, these, the businesses providing these services have attracted a lot of investors attention in recent years, but their true market penetration has not been as, um, I suppose, as, as, as quickly adopted as we've seen in other sectors um, in, in recent years. So I suppose the bottom line here is that despite sector pressures and sector enablers, um, acceleration has stalled compared to other, other sectors. Um, next slide, please, Michael. So um, th these are headlines, um, but Mike, as we were, we were chatting beforehand, it's it's healthcare and the importance of healthcare is 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 shoulder to shoulder with reopening the economy. So online care during and post COVID will achieve economic resilience. It will help us to get back to work. Um, also, there's a greater acceptance of these complementary tools. Um, I don't see much social distancing in that handshake, but um, it's 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 essentially how there's a greater awareness and and look let's 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 try this and let's let's see what works. Uh, online care will never replace the, the physical um, presence, touch of a clinician or that family you know clinic uh, relationship. It will never, but it can complement um, that that a, that as a complementary tool. I'm also coming back to big data and personalized medicine. Um, it's going to accelerate and just open so many doors uh, to new and new horizons to the use of artificial intelligence and personalized medicine. And the bottom line here for all of us is is that a healthy economy is a more resilient and successful economy. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Some trends. Um, so. The, the, the uh, recently we've seen um, we just jumped a slide there, Michael by accident. But on the previous slide we had uh, examples of a software 
clinical software provider called Amwell in, in the US, which has seen a 2,000% increase in visits to its, its software platforms across multiple, um, multiple provision of care. In the, on the continent of Europe, one particular uh, care provider saw a 200% increase in, in the amount of virtual care activity. And from the Lancet, who prefer to use multiples, um, they saw an increase of tenfold in terms of the number of patient consultations being done uh, online during COVID. So, so the question that, that keeps coming up is, is what will this look like as we emerge from and, and post COVID? So uh, estimates range from one in three to two in three uh, visits, whether they be primary care GP visits to outpatient uh, visits. Um, but suffice to say that it will be part of the care economy uh, going forward and, and um, time will tell and, and hopefully hopefully things do return to normal soon. Um, next slide please Michael. So these are some headlines that I'm sure you, your our viewers have, have seen on recent months. Uh, no surprises here. Hospital patients to be seen via video link. Um, one way to limit spread of coronavirus is remote diagnosis and of course um, it's been a real attraction to telemedicine with myriads of, of new players or young players emerging and growing in, in a short period of time. Um, but most importantly, this, this has been enabling uh, healthcare provision. And dare I say it, healthcare provision and economic resilience is the only news as, as we can see these days. So um, next slide, please, Michael. Okay. Um, so I have to my thanks to Rachel and, and Lee at HBI for this, this great chart on the top left here. Um, so where has funding been going and, and who will survive? So, so if we wear our, our funder hats and investor lens, um, two unicorns emerged last year, Dr. Lib and Babylon, um, along with other exciting young companies in the space. So these were Livy, Min Doctor, Ada, Doc Planner, Others were Web Doctor, um, Locums Nest, and many other companies, both in that provision of online care, but also um, providing solutions to the provision of care. So it's been um, it, it, this is this is a market that has attracted significant investor attention for many years, but now those businesses are growing incredibly quickly, aligned with reimbursement, aligned with the appropriate regulation. So as those regulatory frameworks develop around these companies, what does it take to survive? So um, as opposed to a company that may have started really, really overnight or in a short period of time, um, the ones who have robust and carefully developed security platforms will, will endure. Um, those with adequate funding to achieve market leadership, so those who can meet the demand of care and meet their, their um, customers' demands. And those customers might be care providers or they might be care payers, um, but to meet that that surge in online care. But the common thread through all of, of this is that there'll be a patient-centric a patient -centric focus. So the delivery of care, the, the appropriate care pathway is not going to change dramatically, but the delivery of that and how it is accessed by the patient and provided by the care um, clinician is, is changing as, as we, as on, on a daily basis. Um, so the bottom line here is that we're seeing a, a huge increase in the number of players in recent years. So from online care provision to rostering, um, scheduling of care, um, and also to software as a service. So companies that provide just software to these, these companies uh, in delivering the care. So it's a, it's a very exciting marketplace and one that we're going to hear a lot more about um, globally. globally. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Uh, Alan, just, just before we leave this slide, uh, would you mind just, uh, not all of the viewers are as familiar as you and I with these um, with these firms, would you mind maybe picking out the two biggest ones, Babylon and Dr. Lib, and just explain what they do? Yeah, so um, in the middle, Dr. Lib is a French company that provides um, patient scheduling software and is now moving into more um, clinical management. So you as a clinician to help you with running your, your, your business. And then Babylon, which has been around for a few years, is in the provision of care predominantly in many, many countries. So this is your um, moving away from your traditional GP visit to an online GP visit. 
um, so they're they're obviously the two the two unicorns. But I, I think it is worth emphasising that there are many many companies that may not have that um, brand visibility, but provide essential software services to to insurers and to um, uh, to 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 care providers across the globe. So these are um, a few of many, many exciting, successful businesses that we're going to hear more of in, in the next few years. Um, next slide, please, Michael. Um, okay, so we're, we're, we're getting close to, to some of the conclusions already. Um, so, so care provision it will involve more virtual and online care solutions. Um, why? So they will address significant and in many cases unprecedented elective care waiting lists and we were debating around how big those would be post-COVID and how, how long will it take to address those. So depending on which medium or which, which source you read, a typical list might be one to two million procedures in a, in a normal year for, if you take the NHS as an example, but the volumes have increased significantly. If we just take the three months of 2020, which have seen a dramatic reduction in elective care, um, that you know, a significant portion of those um, oncology, of those essential elective uh, elective care activities, will need to be addressed. So, online care will help the care workforce in accessing, in scheduling, in rostering, and already stretched uh, workforce across those those uh, many many patients uh, in every in every society and then the third point here talks to the image on the on the screen so on the left you have your traditional bricks and mortar provision of care that we, we recognize and in the middle we have the policy makers um, governments regulators funders and on the right we have the image we, we had earlier around adoption of online care so, as as we speak and as time goes on, policymakers will look at the the, the two uh, emerging and, and close more closely ways of accessing patients between the physical and the virtual, and funders are monitoring very closely those emerging success stories. Um, so that's that's sort of a, I think a key. If there's one if there's one message I think to to leave today, it's how uh, the policy of healthcare and how healthcare features in policy is going to and will continue to be so so critical to reopening the economy and and its resilience. Um, aligned and future team themes for next time would be artificial intelligence, uh, the Internet of Things, uh, and other other sort of uses that that will become more visible and familiar in the online care world. So. Um, Going up to 20 past, uh, Michael, if we go to the next slide, please, we can remind ourselves of some of the aims for today. So uh, the aim was to cover the role of online care and, and some of the solutions it provides, um, who's been raising capital, who will survive. And then um, I think my, my personal hope and ambition is that healthcare provision and economic drivers are more, more aligned going forward. Um, Michael, that's it. We've hit the 20 minutes, so uh, hopefully um, that's handing back to you our chair alan that's wonderful and uh, it's always nice to see somebody who's so carefully punctual uh, it's a uh, very polite and i appreciate it and we've got time for actually quite a few questions now which is good because there are quite a few people out there uh, many of them experts i can see on the board here um let me let me start with a, a quick one uh, just just to warm up i I feel the presentation uh, could just use just that little bit more depth on it. Hence why I'm afraid I interrupted you over uh, Babylon. Uh, um, you showed me uh, once a, a very interesting Irish uh, firm who was actually exporting and providing a tremendous amount of uh, support. Uh, as I recall from memory, I think it was like in Germany as well as as well as in Ireland. And Ireland, of course, is very well placed, uh, very good health sector. Uh, modeled on the NHS, but on many performance measures, uh, better. Uh, a large pharma industry, of course, uh, and a thriving tech sector. So maybe just talk about a couple of, uh, the home firms that you think are, 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 are exciting, but what do they do? Perfect. Perfect. So if we, I suppose up, up till now, the, the, the conversation, I try to be, um, system and 
economy agnostic and to approach all patients in a, in a manner. So if we look at Ireland, um, companies which, which are emerging are definitely Web Doctor um, and aligned to Professor Mike Smith two weeks ago. Um, online care companies like uh, Turn to Me, um, Spun Out, these are, these are Irish businesses that uh, provide mental health support. And dare I say it, in recent weeks, um, young people with, with schools and colleges being closed, exams being cancelled, postponed, um, those essential mental health services have, have seen an incredible uptick. Um, also in terms of Ireland, uh, I suppose in, in the context of, of, of international, um, you know, they have been able to grow into other countries. Um, online care is not restricted uh, to, to the, in terms of the software solution. Um, so, so these are businesses that, that will grow. And um, yeah, I think I think Professor Mike Smith two weeks ago on this platform highlighted how critical uh, online care will be, especially for areas like mental health. Um, so uh, you mentioned Web Doctor, but you know, they, I think a lot of people would hear Web and Doctor and make up their own mind about what the business is. What what, what does the business do? So perfect. So as a, as a business, it 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 provides a lot of the the services we we covered earlier in this market and uh, this in this conversation. So the video consultation, the uh, development of chatbot, the um, uh, you know the use of e triage. Um, so they they work with insurers and carers to meet their their software and care delivery needs. Um, it's an excellent team, um, and they're they're growing internationally. Um, the, the I suppose the the example in terms of, of growth is that these business businesses have to um, you know carefully select which areas to to develop their markets in and which to be strong in because it's it's so busy out there. So um, you know what what do they do? So they have other they'll have a mix of a software t- uh, engineering capability. They'll have the clinical care delivery piece, and they'll have that, um, I suppose, that commercial piece to work with payers and regulators in, what they, in terms of what they what they require. Um, these businesses have been around for a few years, so a doctor has been around for at least ten, about five, six years at this stage, um, and other companies will 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 grow uh, similarly and, and be, let's say, more recognised brand names as as time goes on. Excellent. No, that, that's helpful. Uh, very, very helpful. Uh, Charlie McEwen, uh, and I, I want to come back to a couple of points there from questions ahead, but uh, Charlie McEwen says, fascinating. Thank you. Uh, care is one thing. Could Alan please elaborate more about the part that technology will play in prevention? Perfect. Perfect. Um, that's a great question. So I think one of the areas we, we didn't, I didn't elaborate on as much was around diagnostics and pathology. So um, with the emergence and arrival of 5G in many more locations, um, the ability for radiologists, pathologists, and the wider screening and diagnostic sectors, um, huge opportunity uh, for them to um, view images remotely, um, to provide, I heard an example yesterday of, of an exciting business that goes to care homes and can have the images taken at the care home. So the elderly patient, typically someone who might um, might be frail or maybe have suffered from dementia, stays in their familiar location, does not need to go to a, an unfamiliar location, and then all the recovery period that's, that's attached to that. Um, so so the, diagnost- the, the remote diagnostic, and then that image being read remotely, um, obviously it's sent from the remote diagnostic unit to the radiologist, wherever they happen to be, maybe in, in their own home. Um, so that prevents a visit to a hospital and a potential risk of infection and other on other complications for an elderly person. So um, it's definitely an area that will continue growing, and and I think five G um, is is going to just propel it uh, enormously. Okay. Um- you know, one of the things I, I find in this, uh, another way of phrasing much of your opening is healthcare needs uh, an increase in productivity. Uh, and COVID-19 is laying additional stress on that need. Uh, but that need's been resisted in a lot of ways. And uh, I've been doing uh, quite a bit recently in uh, the justice area as, as sheriff. 
And we've had these programs to digitize courtrooms of you know, the opposite of remote consultation, you know, kind of remote witnesses and all that. And COVID-19 has meant that a program that was scheduled to last at least two years uh, and probably quite a bit more as the consultants got their uh, noses in. Sorry about that, Alan. Uh, you know, uh, suddenly it was all done in, in under uh, in under uh, three three weeks. <laughs> you know, it needs must. And uh, yeah. a, a fascinating case study of when, when you want to get it done, you can get it done. Uh, and just as well as had it been properly managed. Um, so we're obviously seeing this in the healthcare sector, but uh, at least in the United Kingdom and to a lesser degree in Ireland, um, the role of uh, productivity pressure has been minimal in a lot of ways. Lots of talk, but little action. Don't you just think things are going to slip back to normal? It's so. It's I love the question because uh, one of the areas that I wanted to get into earlier was value for money. Mm-hmm. So the most critical and most expensive resource in all of this is the clinician's time. And if you take the personal example, or, or in general, um, um, a video consultation will be slightly shorter than um, than a physical consultation. There's no, you don't lose time in the waiting room, uh, less risk of someone being late, parking, traffic, and so on. So um, you will see um, for for certain areas of care that the clinician can actually do more visits by using online care that the patient who might not be in a position to travel from a remote part of the country or have to stay over if it is a specialist consultation, it may suit to have that remote um, flying doctor almost or removing the flying doctor uh, analogy by using online care. So already we're seeing uh, an increase in in, a, in the volume of visits and, and care that the, that the clinician undertakes. Um, over time, that clinician, they they may need they may need to spend less capex. Um, so their the overall business of the clinician. I'm thinking more of a of a GP or of a of a clinic or a specialist area. Um, their need for space, um, their capex spend. Um, I don't know what impact it would need have on staff that they need to run the business. But there is an opportunity for them to do more visits. Um, but just to be clear, it will never remove the need for the physical visit. Or the relationship that's important between the clinician and the patient. Um, the, just the just last one is is that on on some um, occupational therapy physio, like I have seen the prices that are being charged, and in some cases they're ten to fifteen percent less, um, because if it's typically a forty minute visit, it might be a thirty minute visit um, online. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's time. Yeah. So rather than charging seventy five, they might charge sixty, sixty five. So um in some cases everyone wins. Um in others it may not be as applicable. Got a lot of questions on the board here, so we're gonna need to kind of sharpen up here. Um just Alan, uh, therefore there's a question here about this, you know, is this really going to be driven more from insurers who really do care about prevention and productivity than it is actually gonna be driven by a healthcare system? And does that, for example, put the UK at a disadvantage compared to other systems which have got uh, more insurance and uh, payment uh, embedded? Um, I'll, answer, I'll answer the question at a more global level, and we can, we can get into the, the NHS in a second. But at a more global level, yes, um, insurers are already adopting and embracing um, online care as, a, as almost a, a benefit, a package that they can offer to their to their premium holders, um, so is is it is it insurers? I think will be collaborators, and and in some cases will find online care uh, complementary. Uh, this is coming back to the to the prevention piece. Um, so so yes, insurers will uh, be part of that. Um, in terms of countries where you have a more national uh, provision of care. Um, I think I think like, take Germany is the example, which I mean each each federal state in Germany is obviously huge, Michael. But already in some German states, where previously, if I was a patient, I would only have that uh, episode of care reimbursed if the first visit was physical. So if I had to see you, my clinician, but only if I saw you physically would it be recognised. 
that's been right wiped away because obviously not possible. And now I can see you virtually for my first my first visit, and then I'll be reimbursed. Okay. Um, following on on that vein, Dimitri uh, Varsamis is asking, uh, in terms of incentives and how tech providers should approach these, uh, do you think there are some key differences in how payers have reacted to digitization between private health insurance and out-of-pocket systems, socialized health insurance, and single-payer models? Or is it a bit too early to see that COVID is clearly delineated in these three areas? Could you list the three again, please, Michael? Sure. Uh, if I've got it right here, uh, private health insurance and out-of-pocket, so the kind of probably, I guess, more the German model, uh, socialized health insurance, and the single-payer models. And the question was how? Uh, can you see some key differences in how they've reacted to uh, your, your proposals for yeah. online? Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to be, this might seem unfair, but I do think it's early comment on that i think it's it is early um but but what we have seen is that um some some countries are are adopting these solutions quite quickly so it is happening uh, it's not all sequential or at the same time um out of pocket i, I don't know yet hand and heart i don't know yet what the numbers are across those three areas but um there i say out of pocket probably will have increased a lot during covid um in terms of the social insurance models and the universal health insurance models, they will take time, but they will adopt it over time as well. Um, and um, I think I think time will tell, Dimitri. But it's it's uh, it's it's a it's a part, it's a big debate, and it's probably the biggest one that over the next few months. Now we're all aware of the uh, issues uh, and some of the huge distinctions between, particularly America, which on the one hand is home to a large chunk of the, the actual core of the pharma industry, but also uh, a large chunk of online advertising and opioid abuse and a number of other things. So Doug Williams is asking, what is the likely reaction of the pharma industry in terms of its marketing and sales strategies in Europe and the USA to these technologies being used? That's a, that's actually online, a very interesting I'm, one. I'm going to be getting recommendations for drugs and things, aren't I? Even indirectly. Yeah. Yeah, but it's 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 a it's a tricky one because you know in terms of the world of the medical rep uh, to to not only to to promote an existing drug but also bring the latest innov innovation they're they're not able to get out there. So uh, yes, I have seen two major U.S. pharmaceutical companies already look at this medium as as a way of accessing and engaging with um, uh, as in. How how can I, the pharmaceutical company, help the uh, medical consultant to be aware of and be informed of the, the, the latest innovation, obviously within the ethical and uh, marketing restrictions that, that exist? So um, definitely already I have seen pharmaceutical companies embrace and get interested in the use of uh, online care and um, using as it was supporting the tools to access new drugs as they come to market. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because in this country, about 15 years ago, we had medics.co.uk, uh, which I believe has gone international, uh, and in which uh, both myself, uh, in a very minor way, and Professor Mike Smith, whom you mentioned, spoke two weeks ago on telepsychiatry, uh, had a hand, uh, Mike, Mike, a very huge hand in it. And the model was interesting. It was there to really... Uh, use the fact that the pharmaceutical companies are spending so much money on reps and to and to basically set up effectively like a YouGov amongst real cl clinicians and to find ways to compensate them for providing feedback on, on trials of various drugs and their experiences in the round, uh, customer care, packaging, the whole lot. Uh, and that's grown. I think it's uh, just, just under 50% of uh, the 110,000 registered people on the general medical register are part of uh, of medics. So there's, there's huge areas here where, where people are are, are changing it. Um, th there's an interesting question here from uh, Charles King again. Uh, mental and physical health are often associated. Is there a place for technology to motivate social interaction and healthy exercise and so be preventative? Uh, it's interesting because I, I could see uh, from Charles's point here, a lot of the uh, things that we're seeing in terms of at-home uh, exercise and interaction 
uh, blend into the whole health and care area. Uh, have you been looking at some of the investment numbers on that as well? Um, physical, no, I haven't. I haven't included that. Um, mental health, um, definitely. Um, there are a lot of, um, I suppose, in the context of mental health prevention and, and wider anxiety, youth anxiety, and, and so on. Um, it's it's an it's a sector that has been growing, and I expect will accelerate uh, incredibly quickly. Um, have I seen the delivery of mental health coincide with the physical? Not yet. Um, now clearly, there'd be recommendations in terms of how the clinician interacts and what recommendations they might make to the to the patient. But um, no, I haven't seen those collide just yet. Um, but I do see mental health working more closely with primary care, definitely. Yeah. You can kind of see this, can't you? Because you've got you've got people on the one hand doing what are clearly doctor stuff. Then you got people handling exercise cycles at home networking and turning into clubs there and then in the middle you can see this group element and then coming in almost from the top the, the mental health aspects the yep. telepsychiatry yeah interesting yeah, I love it. Uh, yep. really good point charles uh ian harris is asking do you anticipate more objection or pushback from patients doing this or is I, I really want to go into care or are you expecting this more from clinicians and uh, there's a sub subsidiary question to that so it's a super, it's a super question and, and to be honest one of my one of my favorite areas that i could discuss a long time but in a nutshell yes the, the patient is becoming much more of a consumer and yes over time the patient may prefer and will prefer, prefer in some cases to see the clinician remotely um it would be up to the clinician sorry up to the patient to have the appropriate software and clinical access to be able to engage just as we are today. Um, but yes, I definitely see the role of the patient as a consumer saying to their clinician, you know what, I just can't make it that day in person, but obviously you know, subject to, to being the same price or being accepted, but it's your time, the clinician, uh, could we do it remotely? Yeah. Um, and, and obviously it'd be the clinician's call to, to decide if that's clinically appropriate. Um, I think I think that the another one of, of note here is that as we go forward, clinical trials will probably include uh, the use of, of online care. So whether there is a, a visit or the use of a, a new medical device or a respiratory, who knows what, that, that there will be ways of using those devices remotely um, as, as, and as we as the as those new trials, and new products come to market, the regulatory processes around introducing them. Will, will change and in, and involve online care. It's a, it's a fascinating area. So is the patient the consumer? Yeah, well, it is, you know, because uh, I, I would hear some of the similar stuff from uh, IT firms. And many of the things people are talking about is very exciting, sound really exciting in a boardroom, but sound terrifying as a consumer. Chatbots, have you ever got stuck trying to get your Samsung television chatbot to stop telling <laughs> you the obvious, you know, is your television yeah. on? If it wasn't yes. on, I wouldn't be calling you. It's not working. Uh, uh, you know, and we've all had horrible call centers. And this, this all sounds in some ways horrific kind of idiocracy gone wrong. Um, on the other hand, I, th I, I might argue that this is about streaming or you mentioned e triage. That in fact, uh, the only point of contact has either been in some systems, the GP or the A and E, uh, which means that there's no point by this talk about the patients there. And now you're dealing with it rather than saying I can stream these in different ways. Uh, and I also think the, the clinician care argument has been a very confused one. There's a whole class of things. I just want to either know that it's perfectly normal to have a fever like that with purple blotches and just stay at home, uh, and I want some kind of reassurance on that, or I want to deal with a minor treatment. Uh, on a major treatment, even if the treatment doesn't need the clinician, I want to hear it from them face-to-face -face as a human being. And these sorts of ability to stream and categorize have, have been missing, I think, uh, from the traditional systems because they try and focus on efficiency of first contact, uh, and that drives everybody up the same path. So very, very tough area. Anyway, Ian continues, are the impediments, therefore, uh, more psychological and sociological, or are they political? That's probably more of a UK question, Ian from West London. So. Yeah. Um so political 
I'll kick that one to touch again. It's early days. It is really is early days. It it is um, anyone in government. I don't I don't envy anyone in government at present, by the way. Um, is is chasing their tail. It, it is it is crisis to crisis. And and how do we get economies reopen? So um, prior to this, uh, if we if we if we answer the question pre COVID, um, yes, there was a natural resistance and and uh, use the word trust loosely, but a sort of is it going to stay? Is it regulated properly? How will it be reimbursed? Um, so a phrase that, that I've heard multiple times in the last few months is that the provision and funding and use of online care, so what has happened uh, in two months typically would have taken two years to develop. That's a phrase I've heard over and over. Um, so it's it's politi- I think it's those, those political interests that might exist in, in various corners of society they are falling away, and and the necessity piece and needs must will accelerate. Um, but most importantly, in terms of our, our our theme today, is that online care will be complementary and uh, aligned to the reopening and delivery of care going forward. So, mm-hmm. if we see it in a more economic resilient context, then those regulatory and reimbursement political hurdles will will slowly f- fall away or or complement collaborate. Uh, I've got time for just two more questions. Um, the first one, uh, I personally have been involved in two very large programs. I led as chief scientist uh, one program on uh, basically automating pulmonary scans. Uh, we really hit the political walls here, uh, the industry walls, resistance from the College of Radiologists to changes in processes and procedures. And ultimately, in fact, uh, that system became the pulmonary cancer detection system for China off of MRI scans, or sort of give up on the politics um, and, and focus on the volume. Uh, and another one, which was uh, somewhat different, which was basically taking scans uh, from Europe and shipping them to areas where there were radiologists in excess supply, oddly in places like Virginia and America, but also Egypt, etc., in both cases, a huge amounts of uh, resistance from the establishment, uh, despite having markedly higher quality numbers. And I go through that because one of the intriguing things is healthcare has traditionally been seen as a services industry and therefore very hard to export. And I, uh, oddly, um, was on the uh, on another webinar yesterday with the former governor of the of the Bank of Japan. And he and I were musing together that maybe what we might see, given the increased acceptance of uh, uh, of uh, communication technologies and human interaction, we might see a huge surge uh, in international exports of services in general. What do you think that might mean for healthcare? Um, so, I agree. I agree that um, if we look at care as a provision of care it is typically a national game as in as in you have on the continent you have social insurance models um and then you have nhs and and other comparable public sector national models so from a pure care provision piece um unlikely but in terms of the use of these tools to to Work across multiple uh, care systems, absolutely, and why not? Um, so, why would you, sitting in in country X, uh, not want to use the greatest or the market leader in country Y if it helps you deliver care more easily and better and, and safely to your your patients? So, at a at a clinical care, strictly care regulatory perspective, those regulatory hurdles will will exist in certain areas. So, this will depend on on certain clinical areas, but in terms of the, the debate you had uh, around the use of the technology, borders will fall away, definitely. Yeah, interesting. And uh, a final bit. Uh, we ran out of time, but I'm going to squeeze an extra minute in. You and I were chatting uh, just beforehand about the recent announcement that there's a 10 million case backlog a couple of years in the NHS due to COVID, which is sort of interesting. Even if everything had shut down for three months, how did you add a year? But let's not go there. Uh, I, I, I do wonder about the numbers. Uh, well, I, I really do. But strangely, that announcement, whatever is driving it, 
uh, could that in fact increase the pressure to uh, address uh, the ad adoption of this technology just to get that backlog down? Might we in fact find that the the thing that makes COVID-19 interesting in terms of pushing the adoption of this is the pressure not due to COVID, but due to the uh, announcement of these enormous backlogs, which will need to be dealt with. I agree. I, I, I absolutely, Michael. Absolutely. Is is um the the how how to which cases do you prioritize? Where do you move the staff? Um, look, simple rule of thumb: a March a March to June timeline of care and the typical activities in those months will be different from from a July to to October. So. How do you reapportion staff? And bear in mind, the staff have been working incredibly hard um, and in very difficult circumstances over the last few months. So are they going to be ready to, to, to just move across and pick up the elective care? Unlikely. So um, absolutely, it's it's going to, uh, there is a, a significant increase in elective. And uh, yes, uh, online care solutions will play a role in addressing that. Mm. Well, Alan, uh, this is an enormous topic, as you know better than anybody, and one that we could go on about for ages, uh, not least that when you're looking at things like productivity, care, prevention, mental, physical, uh, group and social, uh, it's a major part of society. And even in highly efficient and highly rated Singapore, I think it's about 8% of GDP uh, climbing throughout Europe and then, of course, reaching the stunning heights where uh, supposedly a fifth of the American economy is healthcare. So uh, the big and important issue, one I hope we uh, return to, you're absolutely right to have identified and push us to have this webinar today uh, because it really is uh, something that COVID has increased attention upon. Uh, now, Alan, I'll come to thank you in just a moment, if you don't mind me closing by thanking two other groups. Uh, the first is uh, I really would like to thank again our sponsors. Uh, you are enormously wonderful. Uh, please go to our website and buy things from them or whatever. They do a, a superb job. Uh, I would also like to thank you, the audience. You've been uh, phenomenal as well. Excellent questions here. And I've had a number of uh, comments to hand on to Alan, which I would. Uh, I would like to remind you, as ever, the obligatory. We've got quite a bit coming up. Uh, Chris Grant. Absolutely thrilling on uh, Monday, talking about practical wisdom on decision making. Matters debates here in the United Kingdom. We're going to have an in and they're going. Uh, two ethical questions with quite a number of polls, so well worth attending. If you think ethics isn't fun or easy or interesting, this will change your mind. Uh, Dennis Manny on insurance, uh, a veteran of the trade, will be looking at Busan on Thursday. And finally, uh, the ever charming, interesting uh, Vinay Gupta, uh, who created the Hexier, has uh, also created, uh, or at least was the project manager for the first instantiation of Ethereum uh, will also be online. So this, uh, but today uh, online, it's Alan. And Alan, absolutely super. First, for recommending this, uh, and secondly, for leading us through a topic that is moving very fast when a lot of us would have said it was fairly moribund. I'm afraid uh, in this day and age of uh, virtual audiences, uh, you got to put up with me thanking you. I know that all of them out there would love to be applauding, but I'll do the applause for now. So, glad to like it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan. And we hope to see you again in a year or so, and uh, maybe you can give us an update on this fascinating sector. Take Thank care, you. all. Bye-bye.